I'm James Atkinson, and this is Drinks Adventures, the podcast where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and explore trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Hi again, everyone. In this episode of Drinks Adventures, we're visiting Archie Rose Distilling Co. in Sydney. Since launching five years ago, Archie Rose has made its name on gin, vodka, and other weird and wonderful products. None more so than Archie Might, its buttered toast spirit. But today, founder Will Edwards and master distiller Dave Withers are joining me predominantly to discuss their entry into whiskey. Australian whiskey to date has been dominated by single barrel, single malt releases aged in ex wine casks. But Archie Rose has made it abundantly clear that it won't be following these conventions. As you'll hear after this message from one of our valued sponsors. Dave with us. thanks so much for joining me on the Drinks Adventures podcast. Thanks for having me. And unfortunately, Will was unable to make it today, so it's just going to be you and I having a chat specifically about the distilling side of things, perhaps rather than the way that Archie Rose was founded and the business side of things. Why do you think that there has been so little innovation with malt? We've heard the Scotch whisky industry talk so much about cask finishing and the impacts that that can have on flavour, but really not malt so much. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. I think um, all of the industries, both the malt uh, growers and you know whisky producers, have really been focusing on the yield and efficiencies a lot. And I think that really there's just been no category, there's been no line item on the spreadsheet for flavour. And I think that you know having to try and change that to actually get growers and breeders and so on, as well as the maltsters to understand the implications of flavour is quite complex. But there are guys doing it and I think that it is starting to change now a little bit in the industry that people understand that where something comes from and also the variety and how that's been treated can have a big impact on flavour. Uh, for me, I think that the sort of experience that I, I talk about is, you know, being in Australia during harvest, um, you know, standing in the field with those sort of iconic Australian influences, you know, the red ochre dirt, uh, that really sort of 40 degree heat, eucalypt trees, big blue sky, and just trying to reconcile that with, you know, malt or, or grain that would be harvested in, um, in Europe, you know, with those sort of wet, rainy, cold conditions, you know, whether that's Canada or France or, or Scotland. For me, it just doesn't make any sense that we would expect those grains to behave exactly the same. There's just nothing about that circumstance that's the same in how it's grown, treated or even processed. The statistic you always hear in the Scottish textbooks, I think, is something along the lines of, you know, 60 or 70% of the flavour of a whisky comes from the cask. The amount of time you guys are spending on malt, obviously, you don't agree with that. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, I think the cask obviously plays a really important role and that's undeniable. But I think that this idea that no one was really paying attention to the grain and to me it didn't make any sense that people wouldn't understand that the most important ingredient, the most important raw ingredient for making whiskey is ultimately going to give you the most impact of flavour. Otherwise, what's the difference between whiskey and rum? If all we're after is the sugar, um, you can get that a lot easier by just going ahead and using sugar. But obviously we know that rum and whiskey don't taste anything like each other. So the malt has such an important part to play and it's up to us to celebrate that and put that, make that a priority. In Australia, we have to understand how we produce whiskey, you know, that we're not going to be aging whiskey for 30 years because the angel share and just the maturation climate is not kind of conducive to that. So for the way I look at it is that as soon as that spirit hits that cask, the clock is ticking. And that means that the spirit has to, A, have a lot of flavour but also be quite clean when it comes into the cask. So it doesn't need that really long maturation time to sort of be cleaned up. And I think that's a, that's a really important thing for Australian producers to understand that we shouldn't be following the model of the US or the, U, or the UK. We should be finding our own road forward. What we really want to do is take Australian whiskey drinkers and international whiskey drinkers on the same journey that we've been on in production. There's just a two and a half, three or more year delay <laughs> um, between when we sort of laid things down and when it's coming out. But essentially, you know, some of the things that we're going to see coming up is a real focus on what it is to be an Australian whiskey producer. And I think that that's such an important 
thing to celebrate. Otherwise, why are we making whiskey in Australia? We should just pack up and do it all in Scotland, right? So, yeah, I think that that's going to be a continuing sort of program and exploration for us. We've got red gum casks in the bar. We've got about 16 of them. I think we've got eight on display in the actual bar itself. We don't have to have really long aging times. Um, so we can be quite innovative and sort of come to market a little bit earlier than our sort of UK counterparts, provided that we do that knowingly and with a lot of technical expertise, we can manufacture amazing spirits. What do you think Australian whisky is going to look like in a decade's time? Do you think there is already any overarching style that we can say is uniquely Australian? What we're seeing now from the Australian industry, I think is going to need to change. And I put ourselves in this bucket as well, but a lot of sort of smaller casks, you know, we only use 100 litre, but I know there's a lot of people that uh, use a lot smaller. We have a lot of 200 litre casks in storage at the moment. As we expand our production, the vast majority of production is gonna be going into two, three and 500 litre casks for that sort of more longer aging. What are the advantages for people who don't understand the way the maturation works by going to larger cask formats? You just get a better balance of cask to spirit, in my opinion, and there is the opportunity with that to sort of take a bit longer in maturation. So I think that that's an important thing that oak doesn't necessarily uh, make up for the spirit quality itself. There needs to be a really strong balance between what's actually gone into the cask and the cask itself. That's a continuing journey for us that we're, we're wanting to focus on those larger format casks. And you know, we're really blessed in Australia, not so much with the rye whiskey, but with our single malts when they come out, you'll be able to see some amazing ex-fortified sherry casks. Everyone in Scotland fights over the supply in Spain. We've got it right here on our doorstep and an amazing uh, heritage and history of that style of wine production as well. But whisky producers have been favouring other styles of wine casks. Yeah, definitely tawny and wine casks, I think, are very much in vogue. Everyone's been leaning towards the tawny, and now there is some scarcity around those, and certainly I think the wine cask is sort of taking preference there. I think that there is a finite resource there as well, but uh, it does make sense to, to make use of them. You mentioned the red gums just then, which was interesting. I don't know whether that's common knowledge. Have they been filled with spirit as well? Yeah, yeah. So they actually come out of um, McWilliams Winery. And, you know, my dad worked in McWilliams for many years. So I remember sort of growing up hearing about how in the old days, they really didn't have access to European and American oak. So in some cases, they would use native oaks. In New South Wales, there was a very small number of New South Wales red gums that were used to make casks. And we actually managed to get hold of a very small allocation of those. It really plays into that nice thing. It was filled with sherry in the 1930s and really used for sherry production for 80 plus years. And then being able to, they're actually coopered down in Tassie, but being able to bring them back to New South Wales and fill them with New South Wales spirit made from a lot of New South Wales grains was a, was a really nice thing. I think they're definitely going to be a different flavour profile when they come out, but it's a good bit of fun. And we, you know, we have the flexibility in Australia to do that. The legislation says wood, not oak. So we can put it in red gum and still call it whiskey after two years. And so when you're putting it in those barrels, are you trying to get that red gum flavour or are you hoping you get the sherry flavour or do you not really know what you're trying to get out of it? Yeah, look, I think it's a bit of a combination of the sherry and red gum. I wouldn't rule out that we might have to do some oak finishing to sort of make sure it's not too weird. <laughs> but certainly at this stage, we're, we've basically done a first fill red gum cask and we'll sort of see how that comes out. Yeah. You've also made some rum, I believe. You, re you released the Virgin Cane Spirit, so I would be very surprised if there's not going to be a, an aged rum that we can actually call rum coming out at some point. Yeah, look, we're really open about that. Uh, it's in the bar. We've got a lot of our rum casks. I'm a big lover of rum. Before I got into whiskey, it was really rum that was my thing. And I think that, again, it comes back to, I think, the history of Sydney and Australia that we should celebrate rum. Everyone assumes, you know, that it's a Queensland thing and rum kind of has, you know, not the greatest reputation in Australia. 
But really, there are some fantastic rums out there. There's some really quality minor producers out there as well. And I think we would really like to focus on celebrating that Sydney and Australian story a little bit. So definitely, we've got some molasses rum coming up. We need to be educating consumers that we are a spirits nation. Forget beer, forget wine. Before there were grapes in Australia, before there was refrigeration for beer, we were a spirits nation. It's part of our cultural identity. You know, in Sydney, there's so many landmarks that are, that are built around the licenses to distribute spirits, the ownership of houses like Juniper Hall in Paddington from James Underwood, one of the first legal licenses in, in Australia. This celebration of history is such an important ingredient in what it is to be an Australian distillery. And I think we need to play that forward and educate consumers about that. And it's only from understanding the history that we have with distilling that we can really say how we're being innovative, how we're progressing and how we're pushing forward. If you don't have a line in the sand to describe the past, how can you see how far you've come? One of your more bizarre projects recently was Archie Might, the buttered toast spirit. Yeah. What was the reaction to that and can we expect to see any more of your crazy distillations coming <laughs> into the market? Uh, the reaction was mixed, as expected. <laughs> Look, it was a bit of fun. I think that what really started out as this idea that we could just distill anything sort of evolved into something that we felt we could actually put in a bottle and sell. So I have done some other pretty crazy things as well. I distilled a meat pie. I quite liked it. I was in the minority of, of likers. How do you distill a meat pie? Like, what, what do you have to do to the pie first to be able to get it into the still? So we distill the different components, so the, the sort of the gravy and meat and the sort of pastry. I meant to do the tomato sauce as well and kind of break it down and sort of uh, deconstruction of a meat pie style. Um, but I didn't do the tomato sauce. I think tomato sauce would be pretty good, actually. <laughs> The six malt new make has been on the market for a while and so I assume that's going to be the base for the single malt whiskey which we're going to see in the new year. Yeah, it's very similar. So we really wanted to um, put the six malt out and just sort of raise a bit of awareness about what we were sort of doing. And really we, we were sort of giving out tasters of the six malt to a lot of industry folk and the reaction we had was really strong. And a lot of people were sort of saying that we should just put it in a bottle. So we thought, hey, why not? We'll do a limited release. It's a weird product, but it does really well in some surprising cocktails. Um, like a Boulevardia is amazing. We're not gonna be doing it again. We've had a bit of fun with it. Really, it's just a prelude or a, a kind of, you know, a sign of things to come with the actual finished whiskey. And what was the thought process that went into creating this interesting malt bill for the single malt whiskey. Once again, you obviously didn't want to just make a conventional single malt whiskey. Well, we started out making very conventional single malt whiskey. And I think that uh, the most important question that we had to ask in those early days was why? Why are we using this yeast? Why are we using this barley? Why are we distilling it this way? If we think we can do better, why not? And so what we basically started with was uh, a whole bunch of trials and looking at how malt could impact flavour and very subtle changes had profound differences. So we looked how far we could push that and take that and really where we ended up with was a broad spectrum of different flavour profiles that could be created by these malts. We've distilled some pretty interesting stuff. So traditionally I suppose malt is a two row variety for brewing or distilling. We've done six row varieties which are normally sort of cattle feed and they act very differently but give you very different flavors as well so it's that sort of stuff where you know we're so used to being really focused on this very small part of what malt can do for whiskey or beer or what have you but there's a massive amount of stuff out there that just is waiting to be sort of delved into and explored we mentioned it in passing before but tell me about what's happening with the botany distillery, obviously a massive investment by Archie Rose, a huge facility there. Is that just going to be making, you know, your volume products? What's going to happen 
with the two sites? Essentially where we are now is a pretty manual sort of place and it's great. I mean, you, you really have a good solid feel and touch for, for making things, but it is a very small scale and it's very difficult to scale things up in that style of production. So as we're moving to the larger site, we are putting in a little bit more process control but there is a lot more innovation. And uh, again, I'm gonna have to be careful and not tell you too much, but there are certainly some world firsts in that setup. And there are definitely, you know, some pretty innovative and progressive bits of technology in mashing, distillation, fermentation. The gin setup as well is gonna be highly innovative and is one of only a couple of its type. And certainly I don't think anyone has the exact setup we have there for those. Uh, for those stills. So it's going to be a pretty amazing sort of project. So yeah, it will make our core range production, but we've built so much flexibility in it. And pairing that with the process control means that we would be silly not to take advantage of the scale and also the ability and flexibility of the kit to do some really cool and innovative stuff. So it's really not going to be that place is just doing our sort of, you know, core range stuff and that's fine. It's just hammering out the volume. It will continue to be a tool for innovating and progressing uh, the industry and what we're doing. Rosebury though will be a dedicated R&D site and it's really going to be a giant sandbox for the distillers. So it's our ability to say, hey, you know what, let's make grappa today. Um, let's distill a meat pie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, and that's, I suppose, the thing that we're most excited about. We've got guys from amazing backgrounds and you know, letting people have a crack at different things and celebrate distilling in its entirety is such an important part about Archie Rose that it's great to have a dedicated site we can do that. Your first whiskey releases sold out, you know, in seemed like a matter of minutes. Were you surprised by the level of interest in the new products? I wasn't. I think there's been a lot of hype and excitement about it for quite a few years. I'm really excited to get to the next stage, which isn't the, the first batch, but actually taking second, third, fourth, and all the other batches to all of the whiskey drinkers in Australia and really sharing our passion. Because it's very easy to sell out a batch one, but really for us, I think, and for me, the exciting part is about continuing the conversation and bringing people on the journey as, as the products and limited releases sort of come to market. Fantastic, Dave. Well, I look forward to tasting them as they do come out in the coming years. Yeah, look forward to pouring it for you. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.